And the that, hat probably doesn't help either. Okay, got it. You're muted, Lori. You think after a year and a half, I'd know how to do this already. <laughs> um, well, I want to welcome everyone tonight. Um, this is our second year we've added an educational component to Fusion Fest. Um, these, these films have become our calling card throughout the year. We've instituted um, uh, second Tuesdays of every month watch parties, and we celebrate whatever different cultural events are going on and try and pair up a movie with that. Um, and uh, we usually show two movies and we have guests from other places um, occasionally. Um, actually, Terry, can I mention the thing about the History Center? Sure. Um, just so everyone knows, not only are these films going to be part of the Fusion Fest collection, but we're actually in talks with the Orlando Regional History Center for them to be archiving these uh, films. So um, your films will become part of an archive of people's stories and why they came to Orlando and how they keep their culture alive here. So um, every year this, there seems to be another element that comes out of this. So I wanna thank you all for coming. The purpose of this is a couple of reasons. Um, first, I'm gonna tell you that this year we're gonna do the pairing virtually. Um, we were thinking of doing it live, but when the Delta variant got out of control, we just felt we'd rather be safe than sorry. So um, basically what this uh, session is about is tips, tricks, and strategies for, you know, how do you get to know someone? What are the questions you ask to get to know them? Um, little technical tips and tricks. You know, everyone thinks you need expensive equipment and you really don't. Um, and, um, and I'm just going to ask uh, Jim Martin, who is an accomplished filmmaker and author, um, and former educator at Full Sail University, Randy Baker, a many, many year veteran of the motion picture industry, cameraman, producer, director, um, multi-talented, also a professor at Full Sail, and Nathan Agin, who has come full circle, and I couldn't be prouder, <laughs> was the winner of our 2018 student prize, and soon after embarked on an independent filmmaker career. Uh, he has some stuff on Amazon Prime. Um, he did a, a, a short documentary on food trucks and is now working on his first feature length documentary film. So welcome gentlemen. And of course we have Terry Elson, who is, <laughs> if it weren't for Terry, none of us would be here. So Terry, do you have anything you'd like to say? Um, well, welcome to you uh, filmmakers that are here. Uh, as Lori mentioned, this, the film program is something that we're using uh, throughout the year, and it is really a part of the core of who we are as Fusion Fest. Fusion Fest is about celebrating all the heritages we have and exploring how we're influencing each other. So it's about Central Floridians and that mix that makes us who we are. And Okay, I'm lost. Guys, can you? Oh, she disappeared. <laughs> <laughs> so Lori's muted, but she was saying that her internet oh. goes in and out sometimes. Oh, that's... so annoying. <laughs> anyway, um, I'd like to start um, by asking each of you what would be like out of all the tips and tricks for guerrilla filmmaking, what is like your favorite go-to that kind of saves your ass every time? I'll start with you, Jim. Um, well, I don't think that, I don't have one. When we work together, we can make anything possible. That's what happens when you have access to 95% of doctors in the U.S. plus overseas coverage. We have an advertisement. You can earn yeah. <laughs> healthy. You guys can pay for that? So, quality care is that your finger are we being zoom bombed someone okay someone needed to get muted okay there we go i Jim. think the best thing you can remember is that it, it things things used to be i started out in film when it was expensive to do to be an independent filmmaker you know you had to buy film you had to have camera equipment you had to have a lot of things now the equipment question is is gone you can make get equipment very inexpensively. Uh, 
and put things together. I think the, the biggest thing go to I have is don't don't get discouraged if you don't get investors. Just find a way to do it yourself, and just start doing it. it that's the that's the main thing. If you wait around for um, for any for special things to happen, then it's not going to work. You have to just start doing it, um, and then things happen. Once you once you really start to um, to to get in start filming or start doing it or putting the package together, then something will happen. But if you just wait around, nothing's going to happen. So my go-to is do it. Just do it. <laughs> <laughs> Randy? Oh, yeah, there's so many. You know, it's, it's uh, for, for these types of film. I mean, I've done a ton of these film festivals over the years. And, you know, for me, it's really all it starts with story. It's all about story. You know, you have to you have to really know what the story is before you start filmmaking. And so that's that's what happens. I find a lot of people don't really know what the story is they're telling. And so you got to you know figure out how to how to figure out what the story is. First of all, you got to know the story. You got to really know the story. And then you know if you read any of Jim's books, he, he will you will quickly realize that there is a real art form to interviewing. So you know most of these films for most of you guys are going to start out right away with the interview. You know that's going to be the main body of what you're going to be shooting that interview. So. You got to know how to shoot the interview, you know, correctly. You know, you got to know how to light it. You got to know how to shoot it. Got to know how to frame it. You got to, you know, all, all those things really make a difference. And, you know, like I said, if you read any of Jim's books, you will quickly learn that there is an art to interviewing, you know. And, you know, for me, it goes back to the whole story thing. You got to know what the story is. And then, you, you know, the successful interviews are really all about knowing what you want the person to say. And then getting them to say that, you know, so <laughs> it has a beginning, middle, and end, and you're telling the story. And so they're telling you the story, but you kind of you're guiding them to tell that story. So um, that that's the big thing. And and also realize that when you're shooting these people, when you're going out there and shooting these people, you know, you're you may have experience shooting, and you've been around this a lot. They've never been around this at all. So everything is foreign to them. So it's really all about learning how to communicate with them, how to talk to them and how, you know, you're treating it more like a conversation than actually an interview. And there's all kinds of tips to do that with, but for me, it always starts out with the story. Can I comment on that, Laurie? Uh, just want to say, and you guys are going to come in with nothing. Well, but that's why the, um, the pairing party is your chance to figure out what the story is. When you meet that person, and you start talking to them, that's when the, the story comes to you because it'll be coming from that person. And um, so it, that's why it's really important that Friday the 27th to spend some time and just getting to know them and letting them get to know you a bit so they're comfortable with you and they'll open up and talk to you. Then you can get an idea overnight of the story Then when you've got your camera for the next day with them, uh, you you can you, you you have an idea what that story is going to be. For me, um, I do a little Facebook Live ten minute conversation each day I'm, on Tuesdays and Thursdays, and we ha I have my guests. Sometimes I've never met them before. I'm on like 10 to 15 minutes beforehand, and I kind of ask them a lot of the questions I'm probably going to ask them, but it gives me an idea of where I want to go, and so it may be some different questions when we get live because I've learned like, Oh, there, this is important to them or that happens. So I just wanted to emphasize how important that Friday night pairing party time is uh, as for both uh, for what Randy said. And then also uh, I, Jim, I would pick up on you is that then it's improvising as well, because whatever is going to happen that weekend, you don't exactly know. And so, um, picking up and just going with it. You got a big bottom line is listening. Yes. People mm -hmm. love to talk about themselves. <laughs> they really do. They really do. Nathan, did you have anything you'd like to share? Yeah. One of my, <clears throat> one of my new favorite tricks is actually like kind of what um, Terry said there is doing a virtual call beforehand um, and doing so not only do you get to understand the story and get to know them, but they get to practice as well. Because a lot of these people, they like to talk about themselves maybe, but on camera, it's a little bit difficult. I think a lot of people are very scared to be on camera. So the more they get to practice, the better the result will be at the end, so yeah. Um, just so everyone understands, um, 
yes, you're coming into this cold, but you all already know what the story is. The story is about people that have come to Orlando and made it their home. How do they keep their culture alive? Do they keep their culture alive? How do they share it? Um, is there, you know, I personally am pre-producing all of the videos and are, will be talking to all of the people at some point, preparing them. And, you know, it's like Nathan and, and Jim said, you can just never prepare people for what they're about to embark on, no matter how much I tell them. Even when I used to do location scouting, you try to explain to people what's going to happen to their poor house. <laughs> <laughs> and no matter how much you tell them and they see you laying down the, the cardboard the day before the shoot, they just don't get it. But just so you know, the things I'm talking to them about, like there's one couple that the wife is uh, Asian and the husband is Polish. So while she's the main story, how wonderful to add another layer to it. How do they, you know, do they make like sushi pierogies? You know, I, I don't know. Um, so that's nice. If there's children, that's even nicer. Um, there's one woman who's a singer and has does dancing and has costume. I will tell you that one of our subjects this year, uh, Benoit Glazer, who is a, a major staple in the arts and culture community here in Orlando, he runs Timaqua. Um, whoever gets him will be uh, filming his 1000th concert performance at Timaqua. Um, it is an amazing, magical place. So, you, you know, you might want to start thinking about maybe having also so you know, um, there will be footage being shot by Benoit and his people that you might be able to get some footage. But remember, you only have four or five days. So you really want the footage in your control and not waiting on someone to give it to you. So in the back of your mind, you might want to think about a second person that can be a, 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 like a, a B-roll camera person, you know, to get other stuff, you know, what people think about Tim Aqua, whatever. Um, you know, I've asked the talent if there's a simple dish that they can make. Uh, you know, it's always interesting as Nathan can tell you and Nathan can give us some tips about how to photograph food when it sizzles really loud. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, I, I've just at any I've asked them to get stuff digitally, photographs, videos, anything that can visually tell their story if there's a grocery store or restaurant i'm asking them to clear these locations ahead of time in your packets um you when we do the virtual uh pairing you'll be getting i actually might send that before i'll send you guys location releases talent releases um just forms that you might need but just know that the locations will be cleared so yes you're hitting the ground not knowing a whole lot but just know that i've been working behind the scenes to make your job so that <clears throat> once you get there because you're going to get a dossier on this person when you come into the into the virtuals you know into the zoom and you're going to have time to read that and then we're going to have your person come in and then we're going to put you into breakout rooms so that it's just you and them and you can take as much time as you want there and then you guys plan there's one person i think who has a wedding they have to go to at four o'clock one day um so you're gonna you know here's the other thing i'm gonna say and this is super super important you are all fusion fest ambassadors okay so just remember that we have a stellar reputation and i want to keep it that way so you are an extension of this event so having said that um jim i'll, I'll give you a chance to say uh, let's let's talk about recording sound for a second because this is okay. so important and just so everyone knows because a lot of these people have foreign accents we do open caption them for when we show them because Sometimes you just have to, and it just makes it also ADA compliant. You don't have to do that. We will do that, okay? Just so you know, it's really cheap to do it. Um, what, where was I? Oh, so let's talk about recording audio because I always tell my students that audio is the least important. Everything should be told visually and audio in support of the visual. Having said that, if your audio sucks, your film is going to suck. Okay. Mm -hmm. 
can Nathan, you want to address that Mr. Bacon sizzling noise? <laughs> yeah, I mean, audio is super important. When we made the food truck documentary, um, you know, we I was using a very terrible mic. Um, and of course, when you're on a food truck, it's super loud because of the generators. Um, and so one option, especially for documentaries, is you can go back later and record the ADR. And, you know, we did this, for example, we talked about the sizzling noise. Um, you know, we just took some potatoes, threw it in a pan and just fried them and just recorded that with a little USB mic and just stuff like that. Like with, you know, Audition and Adobe Premiere, like Reverb, you can make almost anything sound good now. Um, and so while it's important to get sound, it's like, don't overthink it too much in the production because you can always cover that later. But there's certain things like interview audio. It has to be dead on. Like you can't replace that. So, yeah. Randy, what do you have to, have to say about? Well, I, I actually have questions. So, you know, just out of curiosity, what are you guys mostly shooting with? Are you shooting DSLRs? Are you shooting uh, cell phones? And do any of you have microphones? We, you have. I, I use different types of microphones for different situations. Right. In an interview, a lot of people will just try to use a shotgun or something on their camera if they have a small camera. And I try to dissuade them from that. Put the microphone on the person, and then you're going to get good, decent sound that you can work with. Make sure the levels are decent, and you'll you can always sweeten it. You can always work with it. But if you've got uh, a shotgun microphone or something on a boom pole and it's not pointed directly, and there's a lot of ambient noise in the, in the area, you could be in big trouble. So it, if you have to do it you, a certain way, then then and there's no other way and you can't get a microphone on the person, then you got to do what you have to do. But I can tell you, we we just finished, we're working on this documentary in China and I couldn't communicate all the time uh, with, with in certain interview situations. And we had some really loud ambient sound in the background and uh, a boom pole microphone and it was awful. We had to go back and do the interview again. So it's it's, that's the main, the key thing for interviews. See if you can get a your microphone on the person if it's at all possible. It's the best. The best you'll get the best sound. You have to look at it. You have to look at it a little. You know, I I just I'm in the middle of posting right now a documentary on homelessness and mental illness that I shot and produced and wrote and uh, did everything myself. Lit the whole thing. It was just a one man. I think I had a. PA helping me for about four days on it, but that was about it. And, and so I rarely do an interview without a shotgun mic and a lot, you know, and I, my mix them because you, you got to understand the, what each of those mics do. The, the lav mics gives you the presence, that chest, inner chest, deep bass kind of thing. And then the shotgun mics give you presence of the room. So when you, if you record those, first of all, you got backups in case something happens to the wireless mic, you start getting hits or something. Second of all, you know, when you mix those, it's a much richer, much fuller sound. Now, m most of you aren't going to be able to do a shotgun mic and a lav uh, together. I, I, I would doubt that. Um, or are you going to be able to do that? If you can't do both, which is a great idea, then just do a presence track. Uh, get, get some ambient sound. Uh, after you finish the interview and uh, use that on a loop or whatever you yeah you always have to get room, what's called room tone or presence yes. you know Just after so you've you done know, the interview on a film shoot because a lot of people here are students when you're done shooting at a location they'll ask everyone to stop the work for 60 seconds so that audio can record room tone because that can be looped over and over again, just to get the, you know, you know, we don't realize in our day to day life that a, a certain fixture lighting fixture might make a certain noise or, you know, I have a thing in my room that my son hears when he comes in my room, but I don't hear it because I'm old, you know, so, but, but it's part of the room tone, you know, so how did you get rid of the loud generator noise, Nathan? How did you oh, do I guess, that? I mean, oh, yes. oh, for the interviews? Yeah. Um, yeah, we just use a lav and a boom pole. Uh, um, and it's it's still there. You know, you can do certain things to try to get it out, like the noise on Premiere. Um, but there's definitely limits. But, you know, it's something where it's like, if you can just get it down to as low as possible, usually music will cover over it. But also, um, I think, like Jim said, sometimes it's kind of, it fills the environment. You know, it's like you're next to a food truck. It's like you're going to hear some noise and it makes it feel like they're really there. So sometimes you can get away with it. Um, but, you know, it's just picking your battles. So, yeah. 
Andy, why don't I just go around and call on each person to give an answer to your question about what equipment they are planning to use that might have some um, yeah, that, advice. That will really help. Okay, how about you, Bella? Um, well, I'm gonna be using a uh, Canon like DSLR um, and I have like a mic that I can attach to the top of it, but I, I wanna plan on buying a mic that I can put on the person anyway. So I think I'm just gonna force myself to do it for this. Um, but I think that's what I'm going to be shooting with. Can, it, can any of you guys give a recommendation on a reasonably priced mic that... Re reasonably priced is probably different for me than most people, but, <laughs> you know, there's there's some really, you know, there's some really good... Uh, so, first of all, if you're going to DSLR, you, you, you'll you have to have either kind of a, a... If you're going with an XLR microphone, you're going to have to have a uh, something that's going to convert the XLR to a a uh, mini that will go into your DSLR for your audio, but they do make microphones that you can plug directly into your, uh, you know, so it becomes whether you want a hard mic or you want a wired mic, you know, and so companies like Rhodes have come out with some decent ones recently, and there's there's a bunch of new mics that just came out really, uh, if you want to really get a good education on that, there's a website called True Audio, T-R-E-W audio.com out of Atlanta and LA, and you'll find everything you want to know now the industry standard you know electrosonics yeah true audio that's it electrosonics are going to cost you a couple thousand dollars you're not going to buy those uh sennheiser you know uh e5s or e4s are going to be 600 bucks for a lav you know wireless lav in a um with the microphone and a transmitter and receiver the roads and stuff like that you can get for a couple hundred bucks you know so they're a little expensive but don't cheap out on if you buy you know you, you spend uh, under you know 100 bucks on those you're going to get what you pay for they're going to be crappy mics you know and they so they're not very gonna, quick yeah yeah so, so it's just better to invest in one for the long term like if this is what you're going to do and you can afford it yeah i would say invest it or rent it you know, here in towns, you got lens, you got a bunch of, you know, got Topham Audio, TAI, and, you know, in town here, you've got, uh, um, you know, uh, the, uh, what's the, uh, come, lens, lens Pro to Go uh, out in, you know, um, near um, uh, Full Sail, actually. And so you can rent a mic for like 35 bucks for a week, you know, uh, so it makes it much easier. And you know, the same thing with the shotgun mic and stuff. You can rent a boom pole and a C-stand and a boom holder and, all that stuff to really do it. But, you know, you're going to need to be able to plug it into your DSLR. Okay, so that's what you're using, a DSLR. And what kind of lens do you have on there? Oh, geez. Um, lens. Okay, that's I'm, okay. I'm a little bit of an inexperienced that's filmmaker. Okay. That's I'm no sorry problem. about that. No when but, you mentioned lens, there's something to remember. When you mount a little shotgun on top of your camera to get sound, it's going to pick up the movement of your zoom lens mm -hmm. if, if it's auto or it's moving or you move it you can yeah. pick it all up every time it changes it picks up sound in the camera as well so mm -hmm. something to, to be careful of all right great thank you thank you bella how about you jennifer what are you using jen can you i'm using a lav um, and I'll, I'll probably, and I didn't even think about it, but that's a great idea to do a boom pole as well. So I'll just be, cause I think it's going to be me, me, myself and I on this project. I keep, I was hoping to get a couple people to help, but it's not happening. So that's okay. I'll do it alone. But I like the idea of doing it and having it on a C stand. So I'll get both. That's a great idea. Great. Thanks. So what about lights? Are you guys either Bella or Jen, are you guys using lights at all? You know, I um, I finally invested in getting myself a canister light, and I have it's like the most amazing. It's got a I I didn't think I was gonna like it. Um, the light that came or the the um, uh, I'm trying to think what it's called, but the the part that goes around it looks like a big balloon, and yeah. the light from that I just shot something last night, and it's it it always gives the skin beautiful tones. And so, and I can dial it up and down. I, I never knew how awesome it is to be able to have control of light. And so um, I'm really excited about using that light. Again, I did get a, I did get a box, um, kind of like a diffuser that I thought, oh, this is gonna be so much better, but I don't like it as much as the, the, the big ominous balloon thing that it comes with. And it's super easy to, to pop up and down. And I, I got it from Amazon and I love it. So 
Um, and okay. it wasn't like crazy expensive. It's looking like a China lantern kind of thing. It looks like a China it's, lantern. It's called a, yes. it's, it's more like a space light, and they're they're right. they look like soft boxes, but they're extended right. out on the front. Yes. It's right. called a space light, but it's that, okay. not the traditional I, space lights that we know that hang down. Okay. Yeah, Thank I you, Jennifer. Yeah, well, how about you, Gonzalo? What equipment are you using? Um, so I actually have a, a Black Magic 6K um, that I've been using. I have a Deity D3 Pro microphone. Um, I was planning, I usually mount it like on the camera and I've done a few interviews like that. I know that's not the best way to do it. It's kind of hard to pick up audio, um, especially, you know, based on like the distance and the focal length that you're at. Um, so I was planning on mounting it, probably just trying to boom it. Um, I have a couple of stands. I just need like a boom arm and then, um, I need the, the 3.5 millimeter audio jack. I just need one that's like longer than what I have right now. Um, and then as for lens, I have the Sigma 18 to 35, um, which I really love. I mean, that's a super common setup, you know, the black magic with like the Sigma 18 to 35, but I feel like it's a really good workhorse. It's like, you know, 18 to 35 is a pretty good focal length and, you know, you, you get a lot of diversity out of it. Um, and then for lights, I have um, like two Aperture F7s, like small LED lights, um, which I really like, but I personally, I, I try to shoot as much with like natural light as I can. Um, and then, you know, cause the LEDs, I don't really have too much diffusion. So LEDs can be pretty harsh and I don't really like that, you know, harsh LED look. Um, so that's something I might need to figure out. Um, but yeah, that's, that's my setup and I've done a few interviews with it and I'm still kind of trying to work out the kinks of it, but yeah, that's what I got going for me. So. One Thanks. thing that you might try with, uh, if you want to move the, uh, shot, your shotgun off of the camera and you have some sort of a pistol grip and a sound person and mm -hmm. they can stay out of the way, instead of a boom, just use the pistol grip and have them squat and point point that point it right at the, where they need to get the sound yeah that work really well in running gun kind of situations yeah it, right it's, it's an old-fashioned way we used to use a really long uh, sennheiser shotgun and that pistol grip and we got great sound got it yeah yeah i mean i might be doing a just be like a one-man band as well but yeah if i can find somebody else that's definitely a good idea and a good tip so thank you for that thanks how about you Corey? So I'll be using the Sony a6500 and then for sound I have the Zoom uh, H5 and uh, I have a lavalier mic as well and hopefully I'm going to have a friend help me boom it and uh, if not I have like this cheap tripod which you mentioned Jim that I can like hide right on the frame and have my Zoom I have the shotgun adapter and that's usually how I catch sound when it's just me. Thanks. For, for lights, I have a few LEDs with some soft boxes, and then I have some pocket lights that I'll hide in the back for backlight. And then I'll use the bounce board as well. Yep. Reflectors Lathan. and bounce boards are great to use. Yeah. How about you, Lathan? Well, um, so, um, you know, um, I've, uh, well, for, um, you know, my, uh, for full sale, um, I've been pretty much filming stuff on like my my phone, um, and I, I didn't really have like I don't have a I didn't really have a microphone uh, before and uh, or a boom up or any like boom anything or any, anything like that. So usually for audio, I just have my actors and or me just like dub in audio. Uh, but um, recently, um, just, like today, I I did buy like a um, xlr microphone with, and with the setups and all that so you know uh yeah i have uh um i have film film stuff on other cameras in the past before full sale like i even film made some short films on some an old 16 millimeter and super 8 film equipment very nice Thanks. So Tara, what are you going to be using? Is, is there a Tara? Yeah, so Tara. McKenzie? So Tara? No? Okay, how about you, Franklin? You there? Yeah, I'm here. What are you, do you know what you're going to be using? 
I didn't, I didn't, I'm, I'm real busy here. That's I have kids here and grandkids and right. yeah. So I didn't really, I didn't hear the question fully. What kind of equipment are you going to be using? Um, well, right now I have two Canon Rebels. I have one that I got from Full Cell and I have one that I bought my own. Um, I don't have a mic yet specific, specifically what I use. Um, what if, if I'm with the a crew, I use the um, I use the mic wherever, wherever it's being used at that time. I have one personally, but for what I use, what I do use for mics, um, I've been creative. I'll use a cell phone. Um, it depends. It depends what type of sound I'm gonna get. Uh, for lights, I just basically bought the um, the three lights from like Amazon that I purchased a while back that I started off with. So I'm not really, I haven't really purchased updated equipment. And that was that, that was in the last maybe five years. So um, I work also, I work with Jennifer in a lot of projects. Oh, okay. So she has equipment. So I've been using her equipment <laughs> and I've been using other people's equipment as well. As far as um, smart, you're not going to be yet. able to use Jen's equipment for this one, Franklin. Yeah. <laughs> so. Jen East or Jen Vargas? So I'll, I'll I'll be creative. I'll find something to um to, um to figure out figure out what I'm going to do and know what equipment I'm going to use. So it depends on what I what I what ideals come to me and what I um choose to do. So All right. thanks, Isabella. Hello. Yes. Um, how are you guys? Good. Um, cool. I love that. Um, I'm going to be using my Canon EOS R. I also have a uh, Canon 5D Mark IV, but the EOS R has been my go-to. Um, for audio, I use the Rode VideoMic Pro Plus. And I don't really have a lighting setup because I also prefer like the natural lighting, but I do have like reflectors and stuff. And then um, I will probably use my 24 to 70 2.8. Nice. Thanks. And who is uh, 619-961-7458? <laughs> I know it's a San Diego area code. Uh, it's Jacob. Oh, hey, Jacob. <laughs> Jacob is one of our filmmakers yeah. from prior years. So, hi. Hey, I got kicked off of Zoom, so I had to jump in on the phone. Ah, uh, okay. <laughs> I can relate, unfortunately. <laughs> so, this year I will be filming on my uh, Lumix GH5 DSLR again and um, Mica Cine Primes. And um, I do have lighting, I have some, a NAM light lighting kit and uh, the RODGO Wireless 2 system with lavaliers. And yeah, that should get the job done. Okay, Thanks. so we've got a wide variety of equipment. That's really great to see. Yeah. yeah. How about you, Gonzalo? Yeah, but I will, oh, I, sorry, I will say though, I will say that, um, you know, it wasn't literally more than two years ago that I was making videos on my iPhone and doing um, what well, one of the filmmakers said I was dubbing. So like literally plugging in a lavalier mic to my phone, getting separate audio and making videos on my phone. So, you know, it's two years has gone by really quick and my equipment, you know, my assets have gone up. So just keep making films, you know, and you'll get it there. Should we give Sitara another chance? Uh, Sitara, if you are there and want to unmute, we'd love to hear from you. Hi, hey. yes, I'm so sorry. I'm working right now, so like I'm trying to do both. Okay. Um, yeah, so I'm going to be using my Canon Rebel that I have. Um, I don't have a mic right now or like any extra stuff, honestly, but I'm at UCF, so I can honestly just probably rent stuff out um, and school starts next week, so that's perfect. Um, but that's really all I have so far. I mean, I have my phone too for other stuff, but I, I gotta tell you, a lot of stuff gets shots on shot on iPhones these days. I've been on many things where it's just iPhones, you know. 
And, you know, I, I got to tell you, I'm not a great video shooter. I'm much better at stills. And I got to say, I have a 12 Pro and the video is freaking amazing for a phone. <laughs> wait, till you, wait till you see the 13 coming out. It's cinematic looking video with ProRes. So oh, that's okay. everything away. I went from the 11 to 12. I usually wait for at least four upgrades. So, um, Gonzalo, what about you? Uh, yeah, I mean, I said earlier, but uh, just to go again, sorry. I guess. <laughs> he's got the 6K. He's <laughs> oh, right, 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 right. Yeah. Well, yeah. Um, yeah. He, here's the thing. Do you guys have any questions for me or uh, the the other filmmakers um, about what this is, um, Bella? Um, well, I, I'm i more of a narrative director, a narrative filmer, so I've never really done a documentary before. Um, and like, to be honest, I'm quite nervous about this just because I know there's a lot more um, to it than just, you know, like getting a good shot and everything. Um, like really having a connection with the person you're interviewing can make or break it. And um, like, do you guys have any tips on like warming up anybody for interviews or like, I don't know, getting um, personal without getting too personal with them, you know, so that they can like feel comfortable around me can as I someone one they don't know. Put you at ease, Bella. This is a narrative film, you know, and, and, and there's become a real controversy in the documentary world. They really don't like being called documentary filmmakers anymore. They rather just be called filmmakers. So maybe if you psych yourself and realize that this really is a narrative film, it's just shot in a documentary style. <laughs> Randy, go ahead. Okay. Yeah, I, you know, just don't be an Annie Leibovitz. You know, there are two schools of thought on this. You know, and any any school of thought is my job is not to make the person feel comfortable. I think that's totally wrong. I mean, again, <laughs> what you have to realize is that everybody. You know, you guys have some filmmaking experience, so you're around the lights and the microphones and stuff like that. But most of these people are never going to be doing that. So first of all, you got to do the pre-interview. That's really important. Kind of know what you want to talk about in the pre-interview and and use it as a conversation. Just talk and listen. You know, a lot of times, you know, I'm really bad at this. I like I said, I'm in the middle of this, you know, documentary I'm doing now, and I just listened to something yesterday where I talked for five minutes and the person answered in one <laughs> sentence, you know, and I. I it was an open-ended question, you know, I, so I was like, I just got to keep, keep your mouth shut, you know, learn to, and, you know, learn, learn the head nod, you know, that if somebody answers the question, you nod your head and don't talk. That's and they'll, if As you don't do that, in their head. yeah, yeah, yeah they, they, they start talking down. again. They're like, oh, he wants me to continue talking, but listen, don't, you know, don't chimp. You know what chimping is? It's talked about in still photography where you see somebody take a photo and then they look at the photo, then they take a photo and they look at the photo. Well, that happens in interviewing too, where they ask a question. As soon as the person starts answering the question, you see the interviewer oh, yeah. down at their next question. You know, listen to what they're talking about. It's all about listening. It's a conversation. So get to know the person. And, and a lot of times the best stuff you're going to get is by listening to what they're talking about and then asking the follow-up question that you didn't think about before. And that's where the story begin to emerge that's where you really get the inner stuff so so learn how to follow up but you know you know i always start out by talking to him about oh you know what kind of music do you listen to because everybody likes music or what kind of food do you like and get and get to know them or who's your children you know do you have grandchildren there you know uh you know so get to know a little bit about them before you sit down now a couple other things that you need to think about i try to have all my lights on and everything set up so when they come into the room it's all set up. So I'm not sitting them down and then flipping on lights and moving equipment in place and stuff. It kind of freaks people out a little bit if they <laughs> haven't been around it, you know? So have all that stuff on and, and let them come in and sit down, make a very comfortable thing and communicate with them. Again, they don't know what's going on. You have to, you know, especially when you're doing interviews, you got to ask open, you know, don't ask yes and no questions because you'll get a yes and no answer. And, and the other thing is, you know, um, when you're interviewing somebody, uh, you know, it's really a, a two way conversation, you know, just really make sure that you're listening and paying attention to what they're talking about, but communicate with them beforehand. Like I always start out by saying, OK, look, they're not going to hear my question in your answer. OK, so if I ask you what's your favorite color and you say red to me, nobody's going to know what that subtext is all about. But if you say, hey, I, you know, my favorite color is red because and you tell me why, then anybody who knows that. So people don't know that, you know? And so you have to kind of explain that stuff to them about, hey, here's the process. Here's what it's gonna to take to do that. And then 
The other thing is don't be afraid that if, you know, I, I listen to some people sometimes and generally I tell them I'm looking for kind of, you know, shorter kind of sound bites. I don't, I can't use a five minute take, you know, so, you know, try to be as concise as you can, but tell me the story. And if I listen to them and they've rambled on and on and on, I'll, I'll stop and say, here's what I heard you say. Can you give me that in another concise way? And so don't be afraid to do that. You have to think about, you have to know that when you do an interview with somebody that you need a beginning and a middle and an end to tell the story. So make sure you have that beginning, middle and end, you know, to tell that story. So, but it's a lot of it's just communicating and talking to the person. You know, um, Jacob has, an, Jacob is one of our uh, past filmmakers and he made a film with uh, Elizabeth Fullington from Guyana. So here's this woman who literally fled Guyana to New York and then to Florida. Jacob's I, brand new in, in Orlando, fresh out of San Diego. Jacob, why don't you tell us what happened with Elizabeth? Because there was a catharsis and if Jacob hadn't pushed her, it wouldn't have happened. Why don't you tell us? Yeah, so I uh, first off told her before I even sat down with her. Um, well, I sat down with her and asked her, her entire life story, let her talk, shut my mouth, didn't say a word. That was the first thing. And uh, the second thing was when I sat her down, I said, um, listen, um, I'm a filmmaker, I'm a storyteller. And so it's gonna seem like I'm attacking you. I'm prying, I'm trying to get the full story. I'm trying to get emotional sound bites from you. And so if, I go too far. Please let me know. It's for this story. If you're not comfortable, please let me know. We can take a break. We can stop. And um, she was a true sport and champion. And she was very willing with her story. And she um, was a very closed woman, private woman, but she did open up and um, she has become a huge sort of testimony for the organization because she, she, uh, basically like kind of came to terms with fleeing her country you know several decades ago and like did didn't know that she had never sort of recovered from that she just kept pushing on so this process was very healing for her and you know it, it may be for some of your subjects as well um so i don't know that'd be my advice is um don't be afraid to push to get what you think is the real story don't be afraid to to dig as I like to call it. And, you know, there's also happy accidents. There was one year, uh, 2019, the guy who won the grand prize, his subject couldn't show up to the virtual pairing. And I remember sitting there watching him on his computer, like freaking out a little bit, trying to figure out what to do. And he just got up and went to the guy's studio, you know? So it's a lot about, yes, having a plan because we do know what the film is about. What's going to be different is everyone's story, but also be open to the unexpected and the happy accidents that happen. You know, um, you just, you got to, again, it's sort of planned chaos. <laughs> it's, it's, it's how I'd like to think about film production. <laughs> I think a lot of making documentaries, people think it's all just go out and shoot whatever's there. But there's a lot of planning that goes into it. I never go out without, if I'm going to interview somebody, I research the subject. I research them. I get my questions in my head. I have them on paper, but I usually throw the paper away when I get there because I know it. I know it now. And so I sit down, have a conversation with the person, I like Randy said, you have all the lights ready, you have everything done. I don't even say action, the camera's running. We sit down and we start talking and the person's relaxed. I listen to them. I don't talk a lot. I just try to get them to do the talking. I don't mind interrupting them if they start to ramble. Uh, I'll come in and, and just redirect nicely, gently redirect it so that they we get into a, into the subject. Um, but I usually, and as Randy has mentioned, I usually get all my questions out of what they're saying because I'm listening and I, I hear maybe a question that I already had or a new one. And the new ones are better than the ones I already had. So it's, it's having that conversation, knowing your story. If you're going to make a documentary, you have a beginning and middle and an end in mind. That can change. Right. That can change. If you find something new. Always. Wow. 
<laughs> but you have a beginning, a middle one, and you have a story to tell. So now you're going for that and you, you have a plan. Uh, that's, that's the basis. It's just like telling a fiction story, but now you, you have variables and you have things that can happen. Happy, happy things that can happen. Bad things can happen too. But that's <laughs> the fun part, man. That's why we do that that, that is it. the fun part, you know, when those you have plans and you're covered. Yeah. yeah. But if you're prepared, you can pivot. You know, you can you you can take advantage of that. I, I did a documentary years ago here in Central Florida that was about this young kid who was going to Lake Brantley, who was going blind. His mother passed on a hereditary disease that they didn't know about, and he was going blind while he was in high school. That's what the documentary was supposed to be about. As we got into it, it turned into that he was Jewish and his best friend was Muslim, and it was all about that relationship. And then the mother and father had divorced each other because the father blamed the mother for passing on this hereditary disease to her, his only son who was going blind. And through the dozens of times that we made them sit down together and start talking about what was going on, they ended up getting back together. And so, Jacob, there's a term for that called docu-therapy. So <laughs> it's, it's very cathartic, you know, when you get people together and you talk, you can, but you, you got to be able to pivot and find those happy accidents and go, okay, this is where we were going, but this is where we're going now. I have a question for the panel. Sure. How, how can we uh, make an award-winning short story? That's a great question. It's a combination oh, wow. of things. Yeah, I think you have you have to really, you know, filmmaking is, you know, it's one of those things where it's like learning how to play a musical instrument or learning how to, to uh, you know, uh, play a sport, new sport or learn a foreign language. You know, it's there's a lot of stuff that goes into it, but it's practice, practice, practice. So it, it, quick and easy answer is practice. You know, I, I, so I, I did an interview. Uh, I was in a workshop probably about 10 years ago and Steven Spielberg was one of the speakers and somebody said to him, how do you become a director? And Spielberg said to the kid, are you directing anything? And the kid said, yeah, I've done a couple short films. Spielberg said, you're a director. It's, you know, it's, it's the doing going out there and doing, but it's, you know, if you, you, everybody wants the same thing. They want to tell a good story and they want to make it look cinematic, right? Those are the two big things that you want to do. You want to tell a good story and make it look cinematic. So, you know, you got to know what the story is going in that. And, and so you're at a kind of a disadvantage because you're just going to meet the person and then go right into it. So getting doing the due diligence, first of all, looking at all the other films before this or looking at other documentaries and figuring out what you like and what style of documentary that you like, you know, that's really doing the due diligence. So a tremendous amount of research up front. And then, you know, for the cinematic portion of this, it's just, uh, you know, Keep it simple. Don't, you know, if you know, put a lot of thought and effort into the location you're going to be shooting in. If you're going to just shoot an interview and that's going to be a big part of what you're going to do. And there's different types of interviews, Jim will tell you, you know, in, in our industry, doing a lot of reality shows, there was something called a sit and lit where you sat the person down in a nice location and did the interview. And then there was actual uh, interviews where you had the person doing something like they, they were a painter or a sculptor. They were actually painting and sculpting as you were interviewing them. And, you know, so there are different ways to do this. But, you know, it all comes down to a great location. So doing the location scout and figuring out where you're going to shoot that is really important. And then having a lot of depth in the background, a lot of depth. Don't shoot up against the wall. That's the kiss of death. That's the number one thing that people do. Don't make it symmetric unless the person is talking to the camera, which they're not. They're going to be talking to you, you know. And so along with that depth, you need a variance of bright and dark in colors. That may sound simple and you may go, I don't understand that. But in that background, you need to have a variance of bright and dark in colors. And here's what you can do. So if you go out there on the Internet and you just type in cinematic looking images or cinematic looking interviews, you know, and you start looking at pictures of interviews, look at what they all have in common. They have good lighting. They all have a lot of depth in the background. They have all have a variance of bright, dark and colors. And they mostly all have really nice looking backlights. You know, it's all about creating that depth in your shot. So make sure you do the interview, you know, right. You know, that you know how to do that. So do you know what side the, here, here's a quick question for you guys. Do you know what side to put the key light on when you're doing interviews? Do you know the difference between a broad and a short sighted key light? 
Okay, so when you're when you're talking to one on one, looking in the camera like this, we're symmetric, and so your eyes go right into the middle of the frame, right? They don't travel around the frame. But if I was to turn slightly like this, I'm turned in at a 10, 15 degree, and I'm looking across the lens now at where the interviewer would be sitting. I'm asymmetric. Okay, so when you're asymmetric, this side of the face is called the broad side of the face. This side of the face is called the short side of the face. So which side you put that key light on is really important. If you put it on the broad side, that's more of a lighter kind of romance, comedy, lighter kind of interview. If you put it on the short side where you're throwing in, Lori will tell you, what's it all about, Lori? <laughs> where the shadow of the nose goes on the face. That's what it's all about, you know? That's it. So if you put it on the short side, the key light coming from the short side, that makes it more dramatic, right. and more okay. dynamic looking, okay? So well, little things the like that. Knows. <laughs> yeah, so it's all about, and there's, there. so once you understand that there's a short and a broad side where the key light goes and determining when to use that, a short side for more dramatic, broad side for lighter stuff. And then there's only four styles of lighting that you do with a key light. Split, loop, well, there's five. Split, loop, Paramount, and uh, um, uh, split, loop, Paramount, and Rembrandt. And that's it. And then the fifth one is flat lighting, where that's why people use ring lights, you know. And each of those four lighting styles have a specific time. You Split lighting is very dramatic. Rembrandt is a little less dramatic. Loop lighting is pedestrian and Paramount is kind of beauty lighting. So if you're shooting older women and stuff or people with glasses, you use the Paramount. So that determines what you're going to do in terms of your lighting style. And you don't need a lot of light. So you can go out and buy a China ball. You can get a reflector. You can use a window. And then the other big thing that you need to understand that's going to kill most people and, and, and Gonzala, here's a, you're a prime example of that right now, dynamic range of your camera. Anybody know what I'm talking about there? In terms of dynamic range, it's the number one thing that's gonna kill you in terms of lighting and exposing your shot. And that is that your cameras that you're shooting with have a very, very limited dynamic range. Even if you're shooting raw on a DSLR, you're talking about you know 12, 14 stops of dynamic range. Dynamic range is the difference that the camera, that camera can see between the brightest and darkest part of the image. And this is why it's important. Look at Gonzalez's picture here. He's got that bright background behind him, okay? So his, that camera on that computer or whatever he's using can't handle that bright background. So he's a little dark and the background is completely blown out, you know? So you gotta make sure that you don't put the camera into a higher dynamic range than the camera can handle. And an easy way to do that is just remember one cardinal rule. Try not to have anything behind your focal point. And the focal point is what? The person you're shooting that's much brighter than your focal point. If you do that, lighting becomes much easier. And then, you know, understand the job of those light sources. When you do three point lighting, it's all about creating three dimensional depth in the shot. And that's what creates, you know, it's not shooting 24 frames a second. It's not shooting at a shallow depth of field. That doesn't make it look cinematic. What makes it look cinematic is having that nice background, a lot of depth, variation of bright and dark and colors, a strong backlight, and then having them framed and posed properly. You don't, you put people flat to the camera like this, it makes a flat looking image. You turn the person slightly and having them look across that, it's all about creating as much three dimensional depth in the two dimensional plane as you can. Let me interrupt for a second, because not everyone's going to have the three lights for three point lighting. So three point, you don't need thing, three lights. No, I what I'm going to say is, for instance, my hair is really white. So if you put me against a darker background, I'm automatically going to have a sense of separation immediately without light. Except if you have a black shirt on like you do now, then black, that shirt black. disappears. I'm just talking about like, you know, yeah. that, OK. Um, if I had black hair, maybe you put me against a color like Jim right. is behind, yeah. you know, so you, you don't need to have three lights. It's about th thinking of different ways to do separation and highlight the people because you may not have all that equipment and you may not have the people to make, you know, use the equipment or help you. So um, there's other ways to achieve that, nice. not as beautiful, but still can be done. I shoot a lot of stuff without lights. You know, yeah. I, I use ambient light and reflective light and, and practical lights. Yeah. So you see that lamp behind me there? That's a practical light. Anytime you have a light in the shot, that's a practical light. 
So again, what you're trying to do is create depth and color in the background with those practical lights, candles, Christmas lights, you know, anything you can put in the background there. And so a lot of times I will use a window as my key light most of the time if I'm trying to shoot without lights. And then I'll have a reflector as a backlight or as a little bit of fill light. But, you know, three-point lighting is a theory. The only thing about three-point lighting, the reason why everybody teaches three-point lighting is it creates three-dimensional depth. But you can do one point, two point, three point, four point, five point doesn't matter the same thing same principles apply you just need to know kind of what you're going to work with there you know when you're doing the lighting but it's you know cinematography is all about lighting there's no if ands or buts about that it's all about lighting you know and i say this to my classes all the time if you shoot under bad light you're going to get a bad looking image you shoot under mediocre light you're going to get a mediocre looking image so always try to shoot under the best light possible so if you want to you know if you want to get an award winning film you know a, a great looking film it's all about story and it's all about lighting and then I audio, you audio. Guys, I like, I like, if i could just add to what randy said it, everything he said, all the technical things, all of those things are, are, are extremely important for award-winning films. But bottom line for an award-winning film is story. story. I've seen documentaries that look like, blah, grainy, this, that, bad lighting, and they win prizes. It's the story. <laughs> it's always about the story. You could, But you can kill your story if your technical stuff is really bad. So you want to bring that up to, to as best you can and, and go for it. I saw a great documentary. It was called Burt something, the original madman. And it was shot on a, a handy cam, you know? And it was a great piece of cinema. And I remember watching a series on Ovation about still photography. And here was this guy who was like a world renowned photographer and he's using a point and shoot. And the point is, is it's not, yes, all these toys, the 6K, the 4K, the blah, blah, it's fine. <laughs> but basically, you it's the person who's using the equipment. It's how you frame something. What's in the mise-en-scene? What's in the background? What's in the foreground? How are they lit? Um, it, it, it's a combination of all that. Ansel Adams' famous quote is, uh, the most important thing on a camera is 12 inches behind it. <laughs> yep. <laughs> In those days, it was 12 inches. And, and here's the thing. When you look at Ansel Adams stuff, they didn't call it Photoshop, but there's a lot of manipulation going on there in the dark he, room. He shot four or five photos a day. That was it on an eight by 10 camera. That's all he shot four or five photos a day. That's it. And then he spent a week in the dark room developing it. So yep. post-production is a big part of this. So it's not a new concept. No, but I don't also, think people realize that. I think oh yeah, you know, like they see this part. picture and there's this, you know, cedar tree or whatever, and it's so well lit and differently lit than everything around it. And it's called, what was it called? Burnishing then? Yeah. Well, Where, burning or dodging. Yeah. Right, right. I so think, and, think, which are terms think, they use in Photoshop now. Yeah, I don't think people so realize so. that what it can't be here just now is important too, and that's post-production. You have to when you make a documentary, it's not just what you're shooting stuff that you think you're going to edit together it's other stuff that's going to help you to edit in post-production your b-roll yeah. uh don't, don't go into a into um interview somebody in their kitchen and don't and not shoot the refrigerator and maybe some a clock on the wall coverage or their or their fruit bowl or something like that get the enough coverage so you have stuff to use in your post-production otherwise you're going to get stuck and you're like oh what can we do we can't edit this so that's that's don't forget that yeah. part. Of it. Here's a really important tip for you on B-roll that, you know, probably nobody has ever told you before. You know, there's a difference between telling stories with B-roll and shooting a single shot of B-roll. So most editors will tell you that to tell a story, you need three shots, a medium shot, a, a wide shot, a medium shot and a close up. What you really need are three shots to tell a story. The wide shot shows you who, where you're at, who's in the scene and what's going on in that scene, okay? The context of the scene happens in the wide shot. Could, that could be a wide shot, could be a medium wide shot, could be a medium shot, as long as it's showing you all those things. The medium shots are how those people in this in that scene are interacting with each other or objects, you know. And then the close-ups are all about the emotion of how that person is feeling. Okay. So when you do those three shots and you change your camera angle by 30 degrees and you change your focal length by 20 millimeters, it's called the 30-20 rule. Old old Hollywood. 
would rule. Now, those shots are together well, and most editors will tell you that you need three shots to tell a story. This is such an important concept that a lot of news organizations like the BBC teach what's called a five shot method of interviewing. Okay, so they have the wide shot, they have the medium shot, they have the close up, and then they have a unique shot, like a low angle shot or you know something, and then they usually do something like an over the shoulder shot. That, that ties in, you know, if the person's looking at something or talking to somebody, where those, it's a kind of an establishing shot to tell you the proximity of where everything is in the shot. So, you know, don't just go out and shoot one shot of a B-roll and think that's good. You know, shoot the wide shot of the house and then shoot, you know, a little uh, close-up shot of the lantern on the on the front porch and then shoot the, you know, the doorway of it, it going into the house. And then you can edit those three things together to tell the story about going into the house. And then once you're in the house, look around and see what things in the house, what kind of B-roll in the house really helps with the story. And then, you know, if somebody holds something up while they're talking about it, you need to go back at some point and pick up what they're looking at, right? <laughs> so that when you see that in the scene, you can cut to the POV of that of going, oh, that's what that person's looking at instead of just as a wide shot. Uh, I, I, I do have a question for Nathan. And this, this goes to another thing that really plays an important role and that's music and sound effects. So mm -hmm. for your documentary you did on the food trucks, did you start looking at music beforehand? Or did you do uh, it after that in post? Yeah, it was afterwards. So I didn't have like customized score on that one. I just used uh, epidemic sounds. Um, but it was definitely something I thought about a lot. I would listen to stuff beforehand a little bit, but I didn't, I mainly used it afterwards. Um, so I would, I knew what I wanted, to, the mood I was trying to do. And so I kind of built out Spotify playlists, for example. And obviously I can't use any of those songs, but it would kind of, as I'm looking through the shots, like color grading or if I'm editing, I would listen to that kind of build out the mood um because for me that's how I started out editing I started out making just like wacky montages when I was a kid and so that's always been my way of editing is kind of editing to the music in some way um because it helps kind of guide the emotion at least for me um and so yeah so and think outside of the box too you know talk to your people you know one of the questions you ask them is Anybody in your family play any musical instruments? Mm -hmm. If they do, have them do a little bit of music for you and record the music and see if you can use that, you know, in, in your film. So there's lots of different ways to get music for it. There's hundreds of free music libraries out there, but you got to make the music match the tone, mood, and you know the context of the 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 documentary you're doing. Well, especially being at full sale, it's like there's a bunch of students in music programs that oh, yeah, it's a great chance to. You know, get on, get on full sail one and put an ad and say, hey, you know, looking for. Yeah. And work. that's good for them, too. It's like it gives yeah. them to show them like, hey, this is something I scored. I mean, that's a big deal for them, you know, so. Yeah. You know, anyone that's a student, you have so many resources to you in other departments. And definitely, you know, I mean, when I was in film school, I used the draw the theater department to get my actors, you know, mm. <laughs> uh, you know, you just you do what you have to do. And being at school, you have so many resources available to you. So um, especially music, because I do not want any copyrighted music used. OK, that that and I will be sending out an email there will be at some point an end slide that we need you to use as a tag, um, so on and so forth. So those those things will be forthcoming in the next couple of weeks. Um, more specifics about the pairing party. Um, but uh, Emmanuel, you just joined us. Um, welcome. And uh, we had been asking everyone earlier what kind of equipment they were going to use. Um, so if you want to unmute yourself and tell us what you or what you were planning on using, go ahead. Yeah, sure. Um, I use the A6400, which came in my Full Sail Masters lunchbox. Um, this is a Sony camera. I have a, not, it's, it's, a it's like a low quality boom mic. Um, I have a lot of equipment. Um, so, but I'm going to shoot it in like the inside of a house. So that's all. Well, you got the it, right now? It, it may be shot inside of a house. It may be shot outside. It may be shot in a restaurant. It may be shot in a park. Um, just so you know, some of the people that we have this year, we have a really broad field. We have a brain surgeon. We have an artist who is incredibly renowned and also a singer. He actually made a piece of art. He, uh, with peanuts of Jennifer Lawrence for Ripley's Believe It or Not. Uh, wow. <laughs> there's someone who's a public servant and a child advocate 
um, a data manager who does Meals on Wheels and also a teacher of cultural dance, a couple that has a flamenco dance school, someone who owned a discount beauty supply uh, place, then became uh, got their bachelor's in biomedical science. We have a neurosurgeon. We have someone who works for NASA who pursues native art in, as a hobby, uh, a multilingual real estate advisor, a belly dancer, a man who is a staple of the arts and culture community and owner of Timaqua, a former tattoo artist become theologian, and a musician from New Zealand. That's just a few. And, and probably by the end of tomorrow, all the people's profiles will be up and you can see um, who they are and whatnot. Corey, you had a question? Oh yeah, I had a question for the panel. I was wondering, when do you guys tend to ask the more deeper and personal questions? Halfway through the interview, towards the end, how do you build to those questions? I, I, I wait till an appropriate, <clears throat> excuse me, I wait till it feels appropriate in the conversation. I know that it, it, I can I can feel it coming on, or I we've gotten enough of um, of a uh, of, of familiarity with each other to to ask that question. But whenever it feels appropriate, you have to really be listening. And if it feels appropriate to ask the question, go ask it. Uh, if it doesn't feel, wait a little bit so it does feel a little better. Um, but at some point, you have to make it make a decision to to ask a sensitive question. Or one that's uh, that's more emotional. Uh, if you watch the body language of the person you're interviewing, it's a real kind of key to how they're feeling. If someone's got their arm, for example, if someone's suddenly puts their arms across their chest like this, that's not a good time to ask them a personal question, <laughs> right? <laughs> but if they're if they're opening up and they're sitting there and they feel the posture is good might be a good time to get into it. You just have to feel it and look for those times when they feel relaxed and when it feels appropriate. Yeah, no. you can usually see it in their eyes. You yeah. see a little twinkle. And, uh, and when you see that, you really want to make sure to capture on that moment because if you don't catch that momentum and it goes away, it's very hard to get that back. Um, mm -hmm. And you don't want to force that near the end of the interview. So usually I typically try to wait till the end, but like, uh, Jim said, if it happens in the middle or something, you feel it, like make sure to, you know, capture it. So all about the emotion. Yep. Yeah. Thank you. I was just going to tell you guys something and I forgot what. So while you're doing that, so a couple of things to think about when you're doing the interviews, the talent's clothing, you know, make sure you think about the clothing in the background, you know, little things that you may not even be thinking about. So try to figure out what they're going to wear beforehand when you do the interview and then try to figure out what the color of your background is. Try to have some complementary colors. If you don't know how to use a color wheel, learn how to use a color wheel. Get complementary colors in the background. There's a reason that you put colors in the background of your shots, especially if you see a lot of you know, movies that have a lot of red and blue in it because it creates depth in the shot. So you always want to be thinking about that. No fine lines, no fine stripes, no whites, no blacks. Try to stay away from that stuff. Again, Hello, what you're trying guys. to do... Yeah. What you're trying to do is try to make it easy for you to do the interview and to light it with the very limited resources. So the more you can do that, the easier it's going to be for you. And then, you know, don't get overwhelmed with all the technical stuff. Remember that it's really, you know, you're getting the story. So, uh, you know, simplify, simplify, simplify as much as you can. But make sure that if you don't know what an environmental portrait is, anybody know what an environmental portrait is? Okay, look at look it up. An environmental portrait is not what you think. It's not a portrait taken outside. It's, it's where the environment, there. yeah, it's where the environment, the foreground or the midground, gives you context to who the person is, what they do for a living, what they do for a hobby, or what the subtext of the interview is about. So the background should, you know, your background always should be doing a couple things: enhancing the story you're telling, helping to balance out the shot, helping to make the shot more visually interesting, and helping to create depth in your shot. So if your background is doing all four of those things, then you've got a pretty decent chance of coming away with a pretty nice looking interview. Oh, I know what it is I wanted to talk about. Real quickly, I want to talk about COVID protocols. I know we'd all like to forget about COVID. Unfortunately, we can't. Um, this was going to be a live pairing session, but due to the Delta variant, um, I don't see the wisdom in bringing 40 plus people into a room together. Um, 
However, I want people to feel comfortable. Again, I'll say it. You guys are Fusion Fest ambassadors. I want you wearing masks. Unless you guys both decide that you're both vaccinated and you feel comfortable, that's something you're going to have to feel out. And that might be something that you might want to talk about in that little meeting on Friday. You know, somehow ease into, you know, if you're vaccinated, say, hey, I'm vaccinated, you know, or, 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 don't, or don't address it and just wear a mask and see how they, you know, needless to say, when you interview them, they're going to have to take off their masks, but you should keep yours on. I think that's just safe and smart. So cough, coughing, coughing like that is another thing that you got to be aware of. I always, <laughs> I always try to have uh, water available for the talent, for everybody I'm interviewing. You don't want cold water because if you get phlegm and stuff in your in your throat and you give them cold water, it's just going to create more phlegm. Give them, you know, room temperature, room temperature water. And that will help clear it up. But I always have a thing of water sitting next to them out of the frame and always say there's water there for you. Yeah. With a straw so they don't drip on. Yeah. The, uh, yeah. And and uh, also, I, you know, my wife still makes fun of me, this, but I carry a makeup kit with me pretty much everywhere I go. That's really <laughs> simple. Hairspray and a brush and some, you know, makeup you know, simple with a couple different tones, skin tones and makeup, uh, some rice powder, just some non translucent powder. actually powders. make these um, rice papers. I think you can find yeah. them at Sephora Alta and they just yeah. kind of pat and take yeah. the shine off of people. Some and you, people are you just pat. Sweating. If somebody's yeah. sweating profusely, you don't give them a paper towel and say, because they'll rub their forehead like this with a paper towel. And that just irritates the skin and makes it sweat even more. Right. You, you pat. Yeah. <laughs> you pat. I'm you make it look going like this, like, like no one knows what batting is. Yeah, <laughs> it's now turned into Sesame Street filmmaking. No, I'm teasing. Yeah, yeah. 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 Um, any oh other questions? God. You know, I, again, I just want everyone to be super clear that you guys are ambassadors. These films are our calling card. They're going to be used in an archive in the Orlando Regional History Center here. Um, and if anyone has any questions tonight, please speak up. And if you have any questions between now and then, Gonzala. Yeah, I actually have a question for you, Lori, mm -hmm. um, mainly about the, the schedule. So I know the shooting days are going to be the 28th and 29th, right? And then mm -hmm. editing is about three days after that. Um, and then uh, I think you said something about the 27th, right? Is that when 27th we're be the is the virtual pairing party. That's where you okay. can meet the person and do as much planning as you can for the weekend. Again, I tell okay. them you guys are going to want to start at the crack of dawn. It's yeah. going to go all day. But again, there's going to be some people that have a wedding they have to go to at four o'clock on Sunday. I'll tell you, if you look at Nigerian flavors from last year that mm. was shot in one day. Okay. You will, yeah. knowing that, you will be blown away because she wears about how many costumes, Terry? Like five costumes and like unbelievable locations. And he spent four days editing. So, really, how you, here, here's what I do is I give you all the tools. I give you all the information that you need to help tell your story and get them to be as collaborative a partner with you as possible. And then how you use that time, you know, maybe, uh, you know, you shoot Saturday and do some B-roll on Sunday, but there's something they're going to do on Tuesday that they think would add to their story or you think would add to their story. So you mm -hmm. add some time in to maybe go film that. They're your five days. You can use them however you want. I'm only going to say okay. is if your film is in past 11.59 p.m. September 1st, you don't qualify for the grand prize. Okay, understood. Thank you. Yeah, you, it's, it's all you. I do everything I can to get you guys as primed as possible, and then I just let you go. Got it. Thanks. You're welcome. Also, um, and I'll be sending out emails to everyone if anyone, uh, we're looking for volunteers for the Global Peace Film Festival, as well as for Fusion Fest. Um, both are great events. Um, if anyone's looking to do any kind of volunteering, um, please let me know. Emmanuel, did you have a question? Yes, um, I was wondering how, now when we say that they moved to Florida, 
are we talking about that individual himself or their family? Because I may have an opportunity for like a story that can like blow this festival through the roof. <laughs> I need to know if it's just okay. a person's family that moved to Florida or him. Okay, so the story to start with is about the person that that we accepted, that applied. However, like there's one woman who's Asian, her, she's Japanese, but her husband is Polish. Fusion, add the story. Is there children? Is there grandchildren? Are there grandchildren? The more layered the story, you know, some of these people are dancers. There's a couple who's flamenco dance school, you know, photograph them flamenco dancing, you know, what's going to determine what you film and what the story, ultimately the story is about that main person, but how does that person share and keep their culture alive? And in a lot of cases, a lot of these people have different cultures within their family. You know, one person was like, our family's like the United Nations. So how did, you know, the whole point is, is that Central Florida by 2030 is probably going to be one of the most diverse cities in America, maybe the world. OK, and we want to know why they're here, what keeps them here, um, how do they keep their culture alive here, why is it important to them. Um, you weren't here for that. And just so everyone knows, this is being recorded and I will send it out to all of you if you want to look back and reference like, what did they say again? What was that camera? What was that lava, whatever? Um, you know, so um, it, basically the story is about why they came here, why they stayed here and how do they keep and share their culture uh, here in central Florida, Orlando. And they might, it might be their parents or grandparents or great grandparents who came here, but you won't know who your person is until the 27th. Yeah, that's, and that, that was my point of clarity. Uh, all right, because that helps a lot because I went and I was out scalping people for this. So this no, 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 we, we come up okay. with the people. Um, Again, you weren't here earlier, but I pre-produce all 20 films. Okay. I have spoken to all of them. I will put my personal notes um, on their dossier because when you come into the virtual meeting on the 27th, you're going to get a dossier. So if there is a second location, I'll have the address to that and everything so that you can discuss that with them. I ask them that to not make that location more than five miles away. I don't want you to spend all your time driving from location to location. Um, unless it's like really going to, you know, it, unless it's like a money shot, you know, and again, that's up to you guys, however you want to use your time, that is totally up to you as long as I have your films by September 1st, 1159 p.m. Okay. But Emmanuel, if you've got a great story that you've come into, please have them apply to be a subject next year. Okay. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, and I guess if you guys are interested in this story, this is a Netflix ready story. I promise you, you're going to love it. Just send me a message. I'll put my email in there because we can do it offline somewhere because this is a huge story. You're going to want it. Okay. All right. We should sure. mention, uh, I, I want to just mention the time limit as well. It's three to five minutes. Yeah. So um, 300 seconds, 301 seconds. Nope. 300 seconds is the max. Is that what five minutes is? I think so. <laughs> Hope so. Did I, I get suck that right? at math. I almost didn't graduate college because I couldn't pass the math competency yeah. test. <laughs> but I knew my math in my cinematography class. I had a cinematographer uh, by trade as a film professor. And man, you had to know your shit. Boy, did you have to know your shit. Filled the factors, the whole nine yards. Um, but I'm dating uh, myself. Um, a couple of resources have been put in the chat. Yeah, uh, Randy's information, Nathan's information. Uh, also, the if you want David, to look want at to put some your of the book in there in the chat. Sorry, if you want to put the name of your books or bo uh, books, in the chat. yeah. Okay, I can put it yeah. put it in the chat. Yeah, okay. and if you want to look at some past films to see what you like or don't like in some of them, fusionfest.org/migration. You can look at all different films, which are just three to five minutes. <laughs> <laughs> 300 seconds. 
And again, Nigerian flavors and the Art of Patrick Nose are the two uh, grand prize winners from the last two years. They're very worth looking at because they're outstanding. Don't forget to have fun. You know, if you're, if you're not having fun, you're doing something wrong. You know, this, this should be fun. Yeah. Uh, that's the cool thing about this. You know, you, you can really have a blast doing it. And you learn so much. I mean, that's the cool thing about this business. You learn so much about, I have so much stuff in this gray matter of my brain here that are worthless knowledge, but you know, it's great. Not worthless, Randy. Knowledge is not worthless. <laughs> Just some more apropos than others. <laughs> well, if no one has any more questions, um, I'll be getting this out to all of you in archives so you can uh, reference it. And um, thank you so much. And I can't wait to see all your films. Thank you. See you all in Thank you. Randy on the 27th. Thank you. On the 27th. Thank you. Yep. See you on the 27th. Thank you, Thank you so much. If anyone has oh. any questions, email me. Don't hesitate. Okay. I'm here for Thanks, you. Lori. Thank all you. Right. Thank you guys. Thank you guys so much. Everybody. All right. I'll be Thank filming. <laughs>